my presentation today is all around pattern and structure and the importance of pattern and structure in our um, in our preparation for both primary and secondary teaching that if the students don't have this ability to be able to recognize the pattern and the structure and the materials that we use inside the classroom, then they're not going to be able to put it in and internalize it and make it uh, an image in their mind if they don't have the materials in front of them. So I'm coming at it mainly from a primary point of view, but I have got a secondary teaching background also. So there will be a couple of activities in here that will have more of a secondary focus, but I'm hoping there'll be something in it for everybody that's in the mix. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, just on the main slide here, uh, work from Joanne Mulligan, who's one of the Australian gurus around pattern and structure. So I've, when we worked with her in 2010 and 11 and 12, I've stolen a few slides from her presentation. Um, there'll be reference to Robin Avril's work or Avril's work in the, uh, the latest report that they've put through to the white paper with the ministry. Um, with uh, also credits to Marilyn Holmes, somebody else that worked with the University of Otago over the years, and Gay West, another Australian guru who deals with a lot of work around pattern and structure, but also the use of materials like um, tablecloths and tea towels to be able to point across the view of actually making some of these resources from scratch rather than buying them as a pre-made thing. So you might see a couple of things from, there, from her as well. So first of all, just a very quick start on what exactly is mathematical pattern and structure. This is what I'm hoping to get through in the 45 minutes that we have today. So why is it important? Why do students even need to learn about it? Why do we need to have a focus on it when we're pulling out a particular piece of equipment to use? What tasks might you use that will help to elicit and expand on pattern and structure? Uh, why do we need to even bother going through this pattern and structure with materials and why is it important for children to be able to see this, these materials inside their minds if they haven't got the material on hand and what this might mean for our teaching, what implications might this mean and what do we have to do to be able to squeeze this stuff in because it's really important. So first of all, just a definition from um, Joanne Mulligan about the difference between pattern and structure. And I'll just give you a minute just to read that. I think when we're talking about pattern and structure, we tend to say it as a phrase rather than realizing that there's actually a connection between the two. So if we're talking about a pattern, it can be numerical or it can be spatial, but it's the relationship with those components of that pattern that constitutes the structure. So we're not going to spend a lot on algebraic patterning today. We might do a little bit just at the start, but our main focus is where are the patterns and the materials that we use and how does that form a structure in our mind that we can commit to memory? So first of all, why is patterning important? Why do we even bother? So maths is all about observing and seeing patterns in what we are doing mathematically. That, that's a given. It also leads to some abstract work and ideas in, with relationships in maths and our national curriculum promotes the development of it and it definitely appears in algebraic situations within our curriculum but patterning is all there for number and for measurement and for geometry and statistics. It's, it's there for the lot so I'm hoping you'll get a little bit of everything in today's session. So basic there are five basic types of mathematical patterns that in schools right from new entrance right the way through to year 13, mathematical patterns are really important. So under the repetition ones, we're talking about a simple unit of repeat. What is repeated? And that idea of ABC could be represented by colors of blocks, it could be represented by words. It could be represented by one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It could be represented by um, a red shirt, a blue shirt, a green shirt, a red shirt, a blue shirt, a green shirt. Or it could be represented by actions like a clap, a knee slap, and a stomp. 
So things can be move, put into movement as well. We can also see 2D and 3D designs, tessellations, patterns that are formed using counters or blocks or tiles on the floor. We can see triangular numbers being able to be made or other growing patterns. And sometimes the growing patterns are not as easy as a simple repetitive pattern. So we tend to leave those out a little bit. They tend to be the poor cousin of the patterning scenario. And sometimes those growing patterns don't actually appear until mid, mid primary at best. But I'm gonna show you a couple of activities today that could take them right down to the new entry level. We're also talking about functions and about how if you have a number at the start and you do something magical to it in the middle, out will pop a different number at the other end. And the figure it out box have some awesome activities on functions if you're not familiar with those. And we've also got the patterns and data, looking at trends, what is trendy, what we've noticed, what, you know, and if you're following the COVID reports, I don't know whether there's too many people still doing that in schools at the moment, but it's definitely there and it's in our midst and it definitely can help by looking at the patterns of what we can see. It helps us predict what's going to happen next. Maybe not with COVID, who knows? So one of the things talking about repeat is about recognizing and being able to pull apart a series of blocks and being able to recognize those and say, this is the piece that gets repeated over and over and over. And you can either use this by separating them and putting circles around them so that they can actually see this unit of repeat. Or you might put, if you've got it in a long line and they're all joined together, you might ask the child, where does your pattern start to go again? Where does the repeat happen? And using an ice block stick down there as a breaker and then putting the ice block stick at the end. So they can actually see that that is the piece that then gets repeated again and again, rather than just reading out red, blue, white, red, blue, white, red, blue, white, red, and not actually realizing where their pattern started and where they need to carry on. Now, I mentioned before about growing patterns. This is one that's been used by little flat tiles. And you can see there that we've got a one by one, a two by two, a three by three, and a four by four. So you might ask the student how many blocks or how many tiles there are all together, but you could also ask what would the next one look like in the pattern? Same goes for this one. So just very quickly in the chat, can you throw in there, what year level or what age child do you think would be able to build the next one in the pattern? I can see we've got year one, year three, four, four, three, four. Thank you for participating and having a go. I think our youngest one that we have there, somebody said a year one. Okay, people are sort of saying year three upwards. Excellent. Let's have a look. So when I click again, this was actually, oh, don't you do this to me. Here we go. That was actually a four-year-old. So this was one of the Australian students. So this is when they were in their kindergarten or their kinder years. Um, but it can be happening because the students just know, the kids just know, oh, it's just one bigger, I need to put another row in, or I need to do another four or five down the bottom and they can just see it. So don't limit your growing patterns to your year threes and ups. Get them to some of the ones further down and just see what they can do. So I want to look now about what structure is, and it doesn't mean we're leaving pattern behind, because I'm hoping you're going to see that you're looking at structures of materials, and that's what we're going to be doing, and, but we're also going to be looking for the patterns that we can see in them. So under structure, we've got numerical structure. You can be counting in twos, where they go two, four, six, eight, ten. And what you're actually counting in is equal groups of twos. So you might be saying one, two, three, four, five, six. So they can see that. There's also a spatial structure of how does something look? Does it have an array? Do you talk about rows and columns or do you just talk about rows? You might say, well, that's a similar shape, but it's got a different size. So we're talking about congruence. We're talking about similarity. We're talking about difference. 
We might also talk about, talk about units of measure. And we've also got the algebraic link to the abstraction and the generalization of A plus B equals B plus A. So this is an example of the same structure, but the use of different symbols. And I mentioned before, if when you were going to do something as a pattern like ABC, ABC, don't only use numbers, use blocks, use leaves, acorns, and grasses use a t-shirt, a picture book, and a colored block, and they can all be used. So you could do exactly the same thing. Now this child has taken a BBA approach, and they've written it BBA, 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 down the block, down the thing. They've also made it with blocks, would be my guess, and then they've drawn it. So they've used green and brown blocks, but they can also show it as a circle, circle, cross circle circle cross so they can take that idea and they can generalize that pattern across different representations really important not one show ponies so before we go any further i asked in my we blurb that went about what the workshop was about that you have a tens frame and a hundreds board and maybe a clock handy what i'd like you to do is just turn those over so you can't see those for a minute and on a piece of paper can you very quickly draw for me those four things? A tens frame that shows the number seven on it, a hundreds board, and yes, you might think that's going to take you a little while, but I'm sure you'll be really quick at that. Um, a ruler that you could measure something using the values of zero to 10, and a clock that shows eight o'clock. And I'll just give you about three minutes work time to be able to uh, do those four things for me. So while you, thanks Robin, while you were drawing those four things, some of you might have been thinking, perhaps if you've come from, if you are in a secondary setting and haven't done a lot with these sorts of materials, uh, particularly the tens frame and the hundreds board, you might have, uh, you might not be familiar with the actual structure of it. Um, I think most people will be fine with a ruler, but later on I am going to show you some examples of what the children think a ruler looks like, and they're quite different, and also what a clock looks like from the point of view of the students, because even though we have one in our classroom, analog clocks are not necessarily the thing that the students use to tell time anymore, but there is still an importance for that. So we'll come back to that as the session carries on, but just leave your um, drawings or your uh, representations off to the side for a minute. So we want to talk about where does the awareness of pattern actually happen and why is it important that there is structure to things rather than just randomness and I don't know whether that's a word but I've just made it up. So if you're looking at this first one you can see that there's been 11 dots just randomly placed all over that that board and the child has had to count them to get 11. All right, there's no structure to it. You've really got to physically count one to one, which is fine if that's what you want the child to spend time doing. However, if we add a bit of pattern and structure to that, it makes it a lot easier for them to count it without actually counting it. Because that child can see, well, they can see a square of threes. So they might know something about square numbers, or they can just see an array there and they recognize that three by three make nine, and two more gives you 11. So we're going to have a go now at the idea of subitizing. And subitizing is the ability to be able to recognize a small amount of objects without having to count them. I'm going to give you, you'll need to pen and paper again, I'm going to give you a very quick look at a series of dots that are set out in the form of a pattern or structure. What I'd like you to do is on your piece of paper, the minute I, I'm going to show you this picture, you're going to write down how many dots you think you saw on your piece of paper, and then you're going to draw what you think you saw and then we're going to talk about it. So all eyes on screen, because you were going to get such a quick look, you're going to go, I missed it. 
you don't get a second go. Are you ready? You can write it down in the chat if you want to, how many dots you thought you saw or just on your piece of paper and then draw what you saw. People are writing in the chat, it's great. Sorry, Robin. It looks as though most people think the answer is 32. Let's go back and have a look and see why. Uh -oh. Here we go. I'm back. Everybody okay? So some people said that they, or most people said that they saw 32. So when we're looking at that, um, I also saw that somebody wrote in the chat that you saw four eight times. Maybe you saw 16 twice. Maybe you saw eight four times. But I didn't give you long enough to be able to see one 32 times. So you have to look for the pattern you have to look for the structure. Let's have a look at a slightly harder one. Okay, are we ready? Same thing, very quick look. Here we go. No, oh, hold on. These are the sorts of questions that you might have asked in the classroom setting. So when you get the PDF, um, I often get, the, get everybody to call out in a classroom what the answer is, rather than me seeing it. And then that way, if you have somebody that said 28, somebody that said 32, somebody that said whatever, you write them all up. You don't confirm or deny. Did we all agree? No, we didn't. Let's talk it through. What did your picture match somebody else's and so on? Okay, ready for the next one. Now we're ready to go. Once again, write down in the chat how many dots you saw and then see if you can draw the pattern that you saw in your mind. This isn't anything new. Um, Steve Wyborny on uh, Auntie Google, if you Google Steve, he will have lots of super sizing or dot images that you can use. Um, there are also lots of other sites that you can use for that also. Um, so you don't have to make them up but sometimes it is actually quite good to make them up, put some counters on a piece of paper, use a document camera, and just see what the students come up with. So you don't have to always have um, one sort of pre-made. Okay, so now we've got one person has put their answer in. Ah, that's interesting what um, Pramod has said, that he said 424. So that's an interesting answer. Then we've got, well, I think the other ones were the answers to the first one. So let's just go back and just have another quick look at that image. So the 424 is actually quite an interesting way to look at that. So we've seen the pattern of four, then the pattern of two, and then the pattern of four for each one. And then we still need to know how many there are in the first one, and therefore how many there would be across those three sets of dots. Um, other people sometimes see that as being a five, two fives facing each other, but the five doesn't look like a five would normally look, looks like a four and a one, which is mirror imaged to a one and a four. Um, some people see the fighter jets from Star Wars. Some people see a dice pattern of a five, but each one of those dots is a double dot. Some people see somebody like the uh, Da Vinci man that's standing with his arms up and his legs down, his legs out, and his body being the two dots in the middle, but each one has got the two dots either side. So there's lots of different ways to see it. There's lots of different ways for the students to be able to explain their thinking as they go as well. And once again, you would go through how many dots you saw 
on the count of three, how many dots did you see? Did we all agree? Let's have a look. And you could also spend time, as I know Julia has in workshops in the past, she's also spent time, so how many different ways can we see these patterns rather than it just being the one or two or three ways that most have seen it, leaving that page up would be able to allow students to be able to really explore those patterns that they can see. I'd like to move now and have a quick look at arrays. If this, if you had to, if I couldn't see this picture and you had to describe this picture to me or this array to me, how would you describe it to someone? And can you pop your thoughts in a chat, please? And the idea of, of what you were putting in the chat is if I couldn't see it, but you wanted me to recreate that or build that using materials, what exactly would you tell me to do? Because some people have said 15 or some people have said three times five. But if you wanted me to actually recreate that, what would you tell me to do? Thanks, Marie. That's what I was after. So three rows of five dots, or I'd like you to make a row of five dots that goes across, and then I would like you to repeat it and colour those dots in blue if you want to. So those are the sorts of things that we're after. So when we're looking at that, what might be the possible misconceptions that would arise? And how would you work through these misconceptions? Sometimes people get really hung up with telling heaps and heaps of information. Like they're saying, right, well, there's blue dots and each one of those blue dots have got a black surround and you're going to need 15 of them in total and you're going to have five in a row and you're going to have, or you can have three, five columns with three in each. And all of a sudden I've got a massive amount of overload, too much, I don't need all of that. What I do need to know is that there are five blue dots in one row and then immediately under that there is another five blue dots and immediately under that there is another five row of blue dots. So I end up with three rows of blue dots. I very seldom bring in the word column when I'm talking about arrays. I leave columns if I'm dealing with a spreadsheet type thing or if I'm dealing with tables or charts but an array, I only talk about rows. So I would talk about this being three rows and in each row there are five dots. So what I'd like you to do is on a piece of paper that you've got sitting beside you, can you do a very quick sketch of that diagram, please? And while you're doing that, think about it, about, so this is an array that isn't, fully fledged obviously it's got our four in the top row and it's got three rows but you can only see the start of the second and the third row with a bit of a gap to the bottom right and if I had asked you to fill in or draw in the rest of the squares I'm thinking as um, intelligent people that are on our workshop that's not such a hard thing to do trouble is when we give that to students to do we can get a real range of responses. This is the responses that Joanne got when she did this with some of her Australian students doing exactly that. They understood that there needed to be squares in there, but they didn't really know how many. Then they realized that things, oh, they thought they could do a wee bit of a mirror image and had still have a big gap in the middle. They needed, they knew that I needed three more squares in each row, but they've left gaps. And then all of a sudden we've got somebody that has nailed that quite nicely. So if you're going to be doing some work on area and it's something new with your students, maybe at level two or even at the start of level three, giving them a task like that will tell you straight away what their understanding of an array is and whether or not they understand that they can use an array to be able to use for area. 
So to be able to increase the awareness, the pattern and structure, you've actually got to highlight it and model it. You can't just let it rub off as a bit of osmosis and hope that your students are going to recognize what you already know. You've got to draw attention to sameness and difference. We talked about that before. You've got to be very explicit on one aspect of it at the time. If you go overboard and give them lots and lots of words all in one hit, good luck. So really take your time with it. We've also got to make the connections between the components of the pattern and structure of something that they've seen before. We use visual memory activities, so we get them to actually physically make it or move it. And there's always the justification of their thinking. So before I asked you to draw what a tens frame looked like and put the number seven on it, when Joanne Mulligan showed us the work from her Australian research, I thought the students in Invercargill are going to be able to do that. So I came back from the workshop that I'd worked with Joanne and I thought there's no way the kids that I work with or the teachers that I work with and work with tens frames, they can do this. I was wrong. Out of one class, this is what I got when I asked them to draw a tens frame and put the number seven on it. This was, I, if, I, if I'm right, it would be a year three or a year four class. So they weren't juniors. And the funny thing was the teacher had been using a tens frame in a warm up activity earlier on that morning. So there's a real range. So what I'm saying is that if this is what your data might look like before you do some explicit teaching, what sort of things would you need to explicitly make reference to when you're dealing with a tens frame? I have one here, which you may or may not be able to see with my background. So if I've got this tens frame, um, and whether you have them horizontally or vertically, the structure is still the same, all right? It doesn't matter which way around you use it. So if you're gonna be looking at that, you're hoping that you would say, well, it's rectangular. So it's either a long rectangle going that way, or it's a tall rectangle if you go down that way. You're also going to mention that it's got a, um, it's got a halfway line down through the middle. So it's got a line drawn down through the middle of your rectangle. And then that there are 10 equal squares on it. So those equal squares, in which case you would cut your rectangle up into four equal parts. And then in those parts, you put your dots. And then depending if you're wanting to show seven, you would also tell them. So if one row was completely filled, that would mean there's five. So what would you do with another two dot, or what would you do for the rest to be able to show seven? So after some explicit teaching around that, this is what we managed to do after a 20 minute session. Big difference. But it's about explaining the pattern and the structure of the tens frame. So rather than always just giving them a blank tens frame to work with and counters to put on, give them a blank piece of paper or a whiteboard instead and ask them to draw their own because then you'll know whether they've truly got it. The next activity was around a hundreds board. Can you draw the hundreds board? And you can see here, this child knows that there's a lot of, this is actually some photographs from Joanne. This is one of the indigenous students that she was working with at the time. You can see here that they've got a whole range of squares. They know that there's multiple squares on it. Don't worry about giving your child a ruler to do this. We don't want it perfect. We just want to see whether they've got the structure. But on that diagram in the top right, you can see they're still writing. I think they're up to number 19 because their page is wide enough for them to be able to fit it in. So why not? Um, they've got no idea of the fact that the numbers underneath each other have anything to do with each other. They're just going to write the numbers one to 100 if you let them. And this child was um, five and a half. This child was just over five and a half and they've got quite a different approach. They know that the tens need to line up all underneath each other. What they've also done with a colored pen is he's gone across, he's drawn his grid first and he's got that, but then he's gone and he's put all the red numbers, all, all the even numbers in red and all the odd numbers in blue. So he knows quite a lot. He also realized he mucked up down through the fours column, but then he just, crossed it off and, and carried on. This child knows a lot about pattern and structure.
I've got here I um, one of my workshops that I did down here in 2017 for a school down here called Woodlands Primary and it's a full primary and two teachers did a workshop for me on um, junior contracts and how they had um, independent contracts running in their classroom and they had some fantastic activities based around the hundreds board so I just want to share those with you now. One of them they took the hundreds board no, I can't see that with my background and they just drew a snail trail anywhere on it and stopped it wherever they liked. Then what they have to do is rub out the snail trail and put the numbers in of where they've drawn the line. So they have to understand the pattern of that to be able to do it. Another one was you throw 20 dots anywhere on the back of the hundreds board and then they have to replace the dots with the numbers. Not an easy task if you don't know your way around the board. This is a bit of uh, creative stuff and any teacher can take home a wee 10 by 10 grid and a red colouring in pencil. You make the designs like the house and the truck and just even a geometric pattern, which one on the bottom right. And then the children choose one of those at random and then they write the number on the back of the hundreds board to recreate the image that you have in your diagram. Rather cool. Another activity is being able to use the hundreds board and be able to navigate around it. So I asked you to have a hundreds board on hand. If you have, that would be great. You can have that in front of you now. If you haven't, for a minute or two, you can use the one on the board um, and you can use that as a screen. So this can be done on interactive whiteboards. This can be done on screens where students can actually make up their own as well by dragging the arrows the yellow, the pink, the green, the blue arrow and making up their own equation. But if we go down on a hundreds board, if we, you put your finger on the number 59 and you go down the hundreds board one square, do your students know that when they go down, yes, they're gonna hit 69, but are they? do they know that that's actually adding on 10 or do they just know that if I go down on the hundreds board, the five changes to a six and life is good? So can they navigate their way around? If I go to the right on a hundreds board, do they know that it actually means to add one? So if you're moving your finger on your hundreds board already, you should have your finger on 70. If you go down another 10 or add 10, you should be on 80. If you go to the left one, you should be on 79. And if you take away 10, you should end up on 69. So we'll just do a couple of these together and then I'll show how I would differentiate that in a classroom. So if everybody puts their finger on 12, Add one, add one, add one, take away 10. Your, your finger should now be on five. Let's do another one, 94. Some children, it will take them ages to find 94 and that tells you something as well. So 94, take away one, take away one, take away 10, subtract 10, add 10 and your answer should be on 82. So initially every child would have a hundreds board in front of them they would either use their finger or they would move a counter around at your discretion. The students that that's too easy for take away the counter and hands behind back this time they're trying to imagine that counter being moved around by just using their eyes. For the children that can do that without any issue, what we're now going to try and get them to do is imagine this in their mind. So what I'd like you all to do is close your eyes and magically draw in the air in front of you your hundreds board. Keep your eyes closed, but can you put your finger on the number seven? So your finger is actually in the air on the number seven. So if you're going to take away one, what would you do? My screen's not on image, so I have to go the other way if you're watching me. So seven, take away one. And then you're going to add 10 and add 10 and add one. What number are you on now? And if that's all in your mind, you're actually doing a double count. You're moving yourself around the image of the hundreds board in your mind, but you're also trying to keep track of the numbers. So that's how I would step that through. 
I've often had children that think they're okay for that imaging bit and they've drawn the number in the air and then they're winking at me. They're looking at the hundreds board out one eye, but they've got one eye closed, so they're almost there. But that would actually help there with that hundreds board component of, if I haven't got a hundreds board in my mind, but I all of a sudden have to add 20 to a number, if I can see that hundreds board, I know I have to drop down two, two times. This next activity is, is an activity specifically for older students. And what I've done here is just off to the left hand side, I have a range of plastic colored little decorative tiles that look like, oh, you can't see it. You might be able to see it. That's the three. And if I just, no, you can't see it against my background. So what I've done is I have taken this one here and if I put that on a hundred, excuse me, husband's just come home, dog's deciding to bark to greet. Um, with this one here, if I place that on the hundreds board like that, it's got the one, two, three covered. If I asked you to add those three numbers up, you would get six. If I moved it across and put it on the three, four, five section and asked you to add that up, you would get 12. If we dropped it down and put it on the 14, 15, 16, you would get 45. My question to you is, is how do you know that that quickly without having to uh, add them up at that point by hand or by paper or by whatever. What am I doing that's helping me get that really, really quickly? Any thoughts? On to the chat if you have. So I placed it on, if I put it on the 24, 25, 26, I know the answer would be 75. Anybody have any thoughts? Okay, so some people added, so the 24, 25, 26, some people added up the three 20s, gave them 60, and then added up the four and the five and the six to add the ones on. What if I told you that the middle number was N? Yeah, thanks, So, If the middle number was N, then the number to the left of it would be N minus one. The number to the right of it would be N plus one, which means you've got three lots of N. It's just three times the middle number. So that works anywhere on the hundreds board. Another one that's particularly good like that is this pattern here, which has got this one here. And that would actually work out to be five lots of N because this number here is N, N minus one, N plus one, N take away 10, N plus 10, giving you five lots of N. So the way I've made those, those little um, envelope pocket clear files that you throw bits of paper in. I just cut around the outside of that and get rid of the, the edging around the outside of that. Very carefully put that through the photocopier with that page on the top of it and um, then cut them up. And that's what all of these little plastic bits are that I have for that. But that could be very well be a great investigation in a primary in a higher primary or secondary sector to be able to be bringing in some algebraic equation in. All right, rulers. I'm going to move my move along a wee bit faster for these next few slides. So I asked you to draw a ruler from memory. This is what some students in one of the classes that I was working in came up with. Um, the one in the middle is thanks to Smiggle. So if you ever buy a ruler from Smiggle, chances are it'll have clouds and unicorns and trucks or whatever all over it and that's all that child will actually see they will see the clouds they will see the images that are on that ruler rather than anything to do with the maths so 
when we put those in order, you can actually see that the pattern and structure awareness of these students gets better the more those patterns are pulled out. So you can see on this next one that the smiggle ruler is at the top. This one here, you can see that the students have got the idea of lines on a ruler, but they don't know what those lines refer to. They might know that there's numbers on there. Those numbers are reasonably evenly placed on that emergent one, or on that partial one, but not perfect. Then it gets down to the fact that the structural child knows quite a bit because they've actually got centimetres in there. But the advanced child knows that the more accurate your measurement, the more accurate your ruler needs to be. And you might need to start using those little lines as well. Does you, do your students know how to use your ruler other than for just ruling straight lines? Have you taken the time to actually pull apart the way a ruler looks? I asked you to show me eight o'clock on a clock. One classroom of students, these were the four different options that I got out of it. Interesting that they are all round. Interesting that one of them, they've got either a grandfather clock in their house or something with a pendulum because that's what they drew. This child here knows that there's numbers. They've all shown eight o'clock, by the way. but they don't necessarily have the structure of the way a clock normally looks. So this child here is just into numbers and he stopped at 15. He, do, he doesn't quite know where the 15 is on the clock, but he could keep going. I wonder what he would keep going all the way around to. He thought that 11 and 12 had to go up here, but then he got a wee bit lost. This one here kept on going and he got up to 20. This one here stopped at eight because that's what I asked him for. And this one here didn't waste any ink whatsoever and only gave me exactly what I asked for. So this child showed me eight o'clock, not a bad effort, after some explicit details on how to teach what a clock looks like, this is what he came up with after one session. And this is the material that I used to do it. I went and bought a large tablecloth from Briscoe's. I put on it a little iron on hemming to give me a cross in the middle so I could show where the hands might go. And then underneath the 12, the six, the three and the nine, I put another little marker with a little iron on hemming as well. So it wouldn't wash off if I needed to wash it. These paper plates, uh, they're, they're all paper plates just with the numbers on the top. So when you place the red tablecloth on the ground, the plates aren't there. The plates are in the students' hands and they can place them anywhere they like. Initially, they're all over the place. So then you will show them what an actual clock looks like. And you'll say, well, hold on a minute. 12 needs to go at the top, doesn't it? Because the 12 is always at the top of the clock. And then what numbers come around? And if they're not spaced out, then you can move them around later. So that's better than giving them a piece of paper that they have to feel they rub out. They just move around. Then we talk about what do those numbers represent? So currently, those numbers represent hours. So you can tell the time on a clock by just looking at the hour hand on a clock. If it's pointing directly to the two, then it is two o'clock. You don't need to know what the minute hand is doing. It's just the hour hand you look at. If it's pointing to the 10, it's 10 o'clock. If it's pointing halfway between the three and the four, then it's halfway between three and four o'clock, which means it's half past three. That's when you can bring in the minute hand. And when you bring in the minute hand, you can also flip over your plates because the one on the clock actually means that there's one lot of five minutes have gone by. So this is bringing in your skip counting to, uh, I mean, skip counting in fives around to be able to tell the time. So if you were at the minute hand is pointing to the three, that means that 15 minutes have gone by past the three o'clock. Mm. Um, um, well, I'm afraid we're starting to run a little bit short of time. I'm just wondering if we need to maybe start to wind up. I'm not sure where we're at. Uh, another four minutes would probably see me about done, Julie. Are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yep, yep. We're all just approaching 10 to now. Cool. Okay, great. Well, I'll, 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 pull, I'll 
cut a wee bit out and we'll just go from there. Um, you can also throw your 24 hour time on as well, which is something that I've got there on the next one. Looking at sameness and difference, um, these were some of the other resources that we've got, and I was going to go into a breakout room, but um, Julie has alluded to the time, so we won't do that. But looking at any of the materials, it is important for the children to be able to recognise what's the same with this material and what's different. And there's a couple here, you can see that things are made up into groups of five to make a ten. This is made up into groups of five to make a ten. So is this. So is your hundreds board. Two groups of five, make your ten. The big differences are these two here in the middle because they tell time rather than dealing with number and there's a different base in both of those. Um, so very important that you pull out what's the same and what's different with those. The latest report in the white paper that Robin Averill, um, Fiona L and uh, McChesney, and I'm sorry, I've just forgotten the first name of that Jane, author. Jane and Fiona as well. That's right. Thank you very much. They wrote to, they put this to the ministry in September last year to assist with the uh, maths refresh of the curriculum. And in that particular thing, if you're looking at the year level rubrics or the expectations of each year level, there's a complete section in there devoted to pattern and structure. And it's all around look and how can we make use of and communicate about patterns, regularity and structure. So this is very important for a refresh going forward. Um, I thank the ladies for that particular report. It makes very interesting reading and I'm hoping the ministry definitely takes some, some points out of that to go towards refresh. But on that note, um, I will now, uh, I'm at the end of that. It was just one little activity that we didn't get to do. Um, I hope that was useful to you. If you've got any further questions, my email address will be on the bottom of the PowerPoint. And I'll hand it back to Julia to let me know if there are any questions that appeared in the chat. Kia ora. I'm on mute. <laughs> One of those mute moments. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Thank you very much, Avril. That's really interesting. It's, um, I came into this workshop kind of thinking, oh, where are we going to go with this conversation about pattern and structure? And um, you've really illustrated for me what I think is a really important element of our explicit teaching in all levels of the curriculum, that kind of pointing out to learners what to attend to. And that's a really important part of concept development, um, that we, we you know, look at what is possible for, for those structures and, and draw, overlay those structures on top of all the different representations that we use that we don't just assume it's automatically going to have uh, um, have happen you know so just by showing them we actually need to really explicitly draw out those um, patterns and structures so I really thank you I've learned a lot in today's session